Chapter 13 Stuck by an Iceberg Learning Objectives 1. To learn about story of Titanic 2. To understand glacial and icebergs Warm up Icebergs Glaciers You may already know that the Titanic hit an iceberg at 11.40 pm on the night of April 14, 1912 and sunk just over two and a half hours later. Let's know some of the facts about the Titanic. 1. The Titanic is the only ocean liner to ever be sunk by an iceberg. 2. The Titanic could have been saved if it wasn't for a 30-second delay in giving the order to change course after spotting the iceberg. 3. It took 73 years to find the wreck of the Titanic. 4. The Titanic was built between 1909 and 1911. 5. The Titanic was 882 feet in length and 175 feet in height. Have you heard about the ship or watched a film based on Titanic? The largest ship that had ever built. What debacle occurred to this gigantic ship and what happened to those thousands who were travelling in it? Let's read the chapter to know all about it. The SS Titanic set sail on her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York on April 10, 1912. She was the largest ship that had ever been built and was thought to be unsinkable. On the night of April 14 to 15, the Titanic struck an iceberg 500 miles southeast of Newfoundland. The collision tore a 300-foot gash in the ship's hull and the ship sank in about two hours. The lifeboats held less than half of the approximately 2,200 persons on board. 750 survivors were picked up by the liner Carpathia. Archibald Gracie was among the last to leave the stricken ship. I was now working with the crew at the debits on the starboard side forward, adjusting them, ready for lowering the Engelhard boat from the roof of the officer's house to the boat deck below. One of the crew on the roof sang out, Has any passenger a knife? I took mine out of my pocket and tossed it to him, saying, Here is a small pen knife, if that will do any good. It appeared to me then that there was more trouble than there ought to have been in removing the canvas cover and cutting the boat loose, and that some means should have been available for doing this without delay. Meantime, four or five long oars were placed as slant against the walls of the officer's house to break the fall of the boat, which was pushed from the roof and slipped with a crash down on the boat deck, smashing several of the oars. Clink Smith and I scurried out of the way and stood leaning against with our backs against the rail, watching this procedure and feeling anxious lest the boat be injured so as to cause her to leak in the water. About this time, I recall that an officer on the roof of the house called down to the crew at this quarter, Are there any seamen down there among you? Aye, aye, sir was the response and quite a number left the boat deck to assist in what I supposed to have been the cutting loose of the other Engelhard boat up there on the roof. Again, I heard an inquiry for another knife. I don't know who gave it to him. Meanwhile, boat B was thrown down to the boat deck and was the one on which he and I eventually climbed. The crew had thrown the Engelhard boat to the deck, but I did not understand why they were so long about launching it, unless they were waiting to cut the other one loose and launch them both at the same time. Two young men of the crew, nice looking dressed in white, one tall and the other smaller, were coolly debating as to whether the compartments would hold the ship afloat. They were standing with their backs to the rail looking on at the rest of the crew and I recall asking one of them why he did not assist. At this time, there were other passengers around 
but Clint Smith was the only one associated with me here to the last. It was about this time, 15 minutes after the launching of the last lifeboat on the port side, that I heard a noise that spread consternation among us all. This was no less than the water striking the bridge and gurgling up the hatchway forward. It seemed momentarily as if it would reach the boat deck. It appeared as if it would take the crew a long time to turn to Engelhardt boat right side up and life it over the rail. And there were so many ready to board her that she would have been swamped. Probably taking these points into consideration, Clint Smith made the proposition that we should leave and go toward the stern. Still on starboard side, so he started and I followed immediately after him. We had taken but a few steps in the direction indicated when there arose before us from the decks below a mass of humanity several lines deep covering the boat deck, facing us and completely blocking our passage toward the stern. There were women in the crowd as well as men and they seemed to be steerage passengers who had just come up from decks below. Instantly, when they saw us and the water on the deck chasing us from behind, they turned in the opposite direction toward the stern. This brought them at the point plumb against the iron fence and railing which divide the first and second cabin passengers. Even among these people, there was no hysterical cry or evidence of panic. But oh, the agony of it! Glenn Smith and I instantly saw that we could make no progress ahead and with the water following us behind over the deck, we were in a desperate place. I can never forget the exact point on the ship where he and I were located, which at the opening of the angle made by the walls of the officer's house and only a short distance above the Titanic's forward expansion joint. Clink Smith was immediately on my left, nearer the apex of the angle, and our backs were turned toward the ship's trail and the sea. Looking up toward the roof of the officer's house, I saw a man to the right of me and above, lying on his stomach on the roof, with his legs dangling over. Clink Smith jumped to reach this roof, and I promptly followed. The efforts of both of us failed. I was loaded down with heavy long-skirted overcoat and Norfolk coat beneath, with clumsy life preserver over all, which made my jump fall short. As I came down, the water struck my right side. I crouched down into the preparatory to jump with it and, and rose as if on the crest of a wave on the seashore. This expedient brought the attainment of the object I had in view. I was able to reach the roof and the iron railing that is along the edge of it and pulled myself over on top of the officer's house on my stomach near the base of the second funnel. The feat which I instinctively accomplished was a simple one, familiar to all the bathers in the surf at the seashore. I had no time to advise Clint Smith to adopt it. To my utter dismay, a hasty glance to my left and right showed he had not followed my example and that the wave, if I may call it such, which had mounted me to the roof had completely covered him as well as all the people on the both sides of me including the man I had first seen on the roof. I was thus parted forever from my friend Clint Smith with whom I had agreed to remain to the last struggle. I felt almost a pang of responsibility for our separation. But he was not in sight and there was no chance of rendering assistance. His ultimate fate is a matter of conjecture. Hemmed in by the mass of people toward the stern and cornered in the locality previously described that as the ship keeled over and sank, his body was caught in the angle or in the coils of rope and other upper tennises on the deck and borne down to the depths below. There could not be a braver man than James Clint Smith. He was the embodiment of coolness and courage during the whole period of the disaster. While in constant touch and communication with him at the various points on the ship, when we were together on this tragic night, 
He never showed the slightest sign of fear, but manifested the same quiet, imperturbable manner so well known to all his friends who joined with his family in mourning his loss. His conduct should be an inspiration to us all and an appropriate epitaph to his memory taken from the words of Christ would be, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friend. As we gazed awestruck, the Titanic tilted slightly up, revolving apparently about a center of gravity just astern of amidships until she attained a vertical upright position and there she remained, motionless. As she swung up, her lights, which had shone without a flicker all night, went out suddenly, then came on again for a single flash, and then went out all together, and as they did so, there came a noise which many people wrongly, I think, have described as an explosion. It has always seemed to me that it was nothing but the engines and machinery coming loose from their place and bearings and falling through the compartments, smashing everything in their ways. It was partly a roar, partly a groan, partly a rattle or partly a smash. And it was not a sudden roar as an explosion would be. It went on successively for some seconds, possibly 15 or 20, as the heavy machinery dropped down to the bottom now the bows of the ship, I suppose it fell through the end and sank first before the ship. But it was a noise no one had heard before and no one wishes to hear again. It was stupefying, stupendous as it came to us along the water. It was as if all the heavy things one could think of had been thrown downstairs from the top of a house, smashing each other and the stairs and everything in the way. With this second wind underwater there came to me a new lease of life and strength until finally I noticed by the increase of light that I was drawing near to the surface. Though it was not daylight, the clear starlit night made a noticeable difference in the degree of light immediately below the surface of the water. As I was rising, I came in contact with ascending wreckage, but the only thing I struck of material size was a small plank, which I tugged under my right arm. The circumstance brought with it the reflection that it was advisable for me to secure what best I could to keep me afloat on the surface until succor arrived. When my head at last rose above the water, I detected a piece of wreckage like a wooden crate and I eagerly seized at it as a nucleus of the projected raft to be constructed. Looking about me, I could see no Titanic in sight. She had entirely disappeared beneath the calm surface of the ocean and without a sign of any wave. That the sea had swallowed up that the sea had swallowed her up with all her precious belongings was indicated by the slight sound of a gulp behind me as the water closed over her. The length of time that I was under water can be estimated by the fact that I sank with her, and when I came up, there was no ship in sight. What impressed me at the time that my eyes beheld the horrible scene was a thin, light grey, smoky vapour that hung like a pall a few feet above the broad expanse of sea that was covered with a mass of tangled wreckage, that it was a tangible vapour and not a product of imagination. I feel well assured it may have been caused by smoke or steam rising to the surface around the area where the ship had sunk. At any rate, it produced a supernatural effect. Add to this within the area described which was as far as my eyes could reach, there arose to the sky the most horrible sounds ever heard by mortal man except by those of us who survived this terrible tragedy. The agonizing cries of death from over a thousand throats, the wails and groans of the suffering, the shrieks of the terror stricken, and the awful gaspings for breath of those in the last throes of drowning. None of us will ever forget our dying day. Help! Help! Boat! Ahoy! 
boat ahoy and my god my god were the heart reading cries and shrieks of men which flowed to us over the surface of the dark waters continuously from the next hour but as the time went on growing weaker and weaker until they died out entirely as i clung to my wreckage i noticed just in front of me a few yards away a group of three bodies with heads in the water face downward and just behind me to my right another body all giving unmistakable evidence of being drowned possibly these had gone down to the depths as i had done but did not have the lung power that i had to hold the breath and swim under water an accomplishment which i had practiced from my school days there was no one alive or struggling in the water or calling for aid with the immediate vicinity of where i arose to the surface i threw my right leg over the wooden crate in an attempt to straddle and balance myself on top of it but i turned over in a somersault with it under water and up to the surface again i espied to my left a considerable distance away a better vehicle of escape than the wooden crate on which my attempt to ride had resulted in a second ducking what i saw was no less than the same engelhard or surf boat to whose launching i had lent my efforts until the water broke upon the ship's boat deck where we were on the top on top of this upturned boat half reclining on her bottom were now more than a dozen men whom by their dress i took to be all members of the crew of the ship Thank God I did not hesitate a moment in discarding the friendly crate that had been my first aid. I struck out through the wreckage and after a considerable swim reached the port side amidships of the Engelhard boat which with her companions wherever utilized did good service in saving the lives of many others. When I reached the side of the boat I met with a doubtful reception and as no extending hand was held out to me I grabbed by the muscle of the left arm a young member of the crew nearest and facing me at the time I threw my right leg over the boat as straddle pulling myself abroad with a friendly lift to my foot given by someone astern as I assumed a reclining position with them on the bottom of the capsized boat Then after me came a dozen other swimmers who clambered around and whom we helped abroad among them was one completely exhausted who came on the same port side as me i pulled him in and he laid face downward in front of me for several hours until just before dawn he was able to stand up with the rest of us the moment of getting abroad this upturned boat was one of supreme mental relief more so than any other until i reached the deck of the hospitable carpathia on the next morning fine meaning maiden voyage the first voyage of a ship few the personnel of a ship aslant in a slanting direction launch to set off float consternation concern hatchway an opening as in the deck of the sea hysterical out of control crouch to lower expedient useful or convenient conjecture guess appurtenances accessories compartment a separate division wreckage ruin entirely completely tangible substantially real wail mournful groan a deep moaning sound accomplishment achievement straddle to be on land on other side of something capsized overturned exercises creative expression tell your story listen to your teacher carefully who will read a paragraph from the chapter that answer the following questions 1 on which date the ss titanic set sail on her maiden voyage 2 on which date did the titanic strike an iceberg 3 How many persons were there on board? 4. What was the role of liner Carpathia? Cross curricular connect. Learning by doing. Icebergs are large chunks of ice that break off from glaciers. This process is called calving. 
do a quick research and find out about different glaciers across Asia. Critical thinking. Let's play a game. Do research about glaciers and explain the diagram. Exercise time. Answer the following questions. 1. Explain the horrible scene at the time of night. Answer. The horrible scene was a thin light grey smoky vapour that hung like a pole a few feet above the broad expanse of sea that was covered with a mass of tangled wreckage. The agonizing, the agonizing cries of death were also a horrible thing. 2. The Titanic could have been saved. How? Answer. Yes, the Titanic could have been saved if it wasn't for 30 second delay in giving the order to change course after spotting the iceberg. 3. When did the Titanic hit the iceberg? Answer: The Titanic hit the iceberg at 11.40 pm on the night of April 14, 1912. 4. What is an iceberg? How is it formed? Answer: Icebergs are large clumps of ice that break off from glaciers. This process is called calving. Find their meaning. 1. Abduct To take hold of somebody and take him or her illegally. 2. Calamity A terrible event that causes a lot of damage or harm. 3. Tedious Boring and lasting for a long time. 4. Destitute Without any home, food or money. 5. Exorbitant Much more expensive than it should be. 6. Benevolent Kind, friendly. 7. Elucidate To make something clear by explaining it. 8. Slender Smaller in amount Smaller in amount or size than you would like it. 9. Inquisitive too interested in finding out what other people are doing. 10. Disseminate To spread knowledge, idea, etc. Fill in the blanks with the correct words. 1. He could not caught him any assistance. 2. The wave that lifted him, render him. 3. His body was droned in the coils of rope and went down with the ship. 4. There was a wooden crate which he clung to. 5. The people around him gave him a helping hand. 6. He had developed lung power to hold his breath through practice during school days. Take the right options. 1. The SS Titanic set sail on her maiden voyage from 1. Washington to New York 2. Birmingham to Hampshire 3. Southampton to New York Answer 3. Southampton to New York 2. The writer and his friend were in a desperate place because 1. They did not know the exact place on the ship share they were located 2. Their backs were turned towards the ship's trail and the sea 3. The water was following them and in front of them was a crowd of people Answer 3. The water was following them and in front of them was a crowd of people Match the following 1. Null Nullify 2. Legal Legalize 3. Smooth Smoothen 4. Broad Broaden 5. Social Socialize